Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to introduce JM Scoop, a progressive ride sharing application for JMU students. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our presentation this afternoon. I'm really excited to share our project and all the work we put in this semester with you. Um, I'm Alex. I'm Matthew. Andrew. Um, and like he said, our project is called JMU Scoop, a progressive ride sharing application for JMU students. So we wanted to start off our presentation giving a little bit of why we personally chose to invest our time in this particular project um, with personal story. Uh, so mine kind of starts off, uh, I know when I moved off campus at JMU, I'd have one of two options of getting to campus, and that is taking the bus or driving myself. Um, so I purchased um, a parking pass from JMU Parking Services for $200 in the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. um, that lasts from 2016 to 2017. And on the first day of class, I find myself circling the parking lot looking for a spot upwards of 15 to 20 minutes uh, without avail. Eventually, I park maybe a few lots back from the closest one to where my classroom is. I'm 10 minutes late to class. My whole day is already thrown off. I've lost my focus. Um, and that's just because there simply was not enough capacity for uh, the parking at on campus. Similar to Alex's story, um, Last semester I had a very similar situation where I left my house at the same time every day to drive to campus and I parked in the same spot every day, it was always fine, then one day they started to do construction and so that parking lot was full at that time. And this was a class where if I got three absences, they docked me a letter grade. So I was really worried and I wound up missing class because I was parked across campus and if there had been a test or a quiz that day, it would have been pretty terrible. Another option to get to campus would be taking the bus. However, the bus comes very early to different sub-developments, and so you would have to wake up extra early. If you had a 9 o'clock class, the bus to get there would leave at around 8.20. So it's just you lose a lot of sleep trying to make that bus. So similar to these two stories, my story actually centers around the image you see to the left. Uh, I've been in off-campus three years, the past three years I've lived on Devon Lane. Picture is a backup on Devon Lane and what you cannot see is the traffic signal in the picture because the backup is actually so long that it takes multiple rotations to actually get through it. Uh, similar to what they've said earlier, it takes a lot of pri uh, prior planning to get to campus on time, get to your classes on time. And where some of these professors are requiring uh, mandatory attendance, it really does uh, put a difficult situation on your mind earlier in the day and that's going to affect your day uh, moving forward. Uh, again, this is another stoplight. Um, for those of you not familiar with the area, this is Port Republic Road and this is the uh, the last two cars in the line for the next stoplight. The stoplight is at the bottom of the hill and this is a common backup that a lot of students have to experience when they're trying to get to their night classes. Um, so as you can see, I Google mapped the distance to travel to get to the next stoplight. It's actually close to a quarter mile. So when you think about that visually, that's almost an entire Olympic track worth of, uh, you know, one lap worth of cars, just bumper to bumper, uh, parked next to each other, waiting to get through this traffic signal. That's just something that you're going to have to deal with. Um, and it's going to take up a lot of your time trying to get to class. So if you're a GMU student, which many of you in this room are, you know and live this struggle. Um, if you're not, here's a little bit of the insight into the problem, and I have a map of campus up here, and I know it's kind of small and hard to read, um, but the three purple circles you see um, are the three parking decks that are available for uh, students to park in during the regular uh, class time hours. There is the Champions parking deck, um, which is this one right here, um, and that is by the lakeside on main campus. Um, on the upper left corner, that is the Warsaw deck, which is behind the Forbes Performing Arts Center by the Quad. And on the right corner, that is the newly constructed Mason Street deck, um, which is new this year. Um, but all three of these parking decks are about full at least 10 a.m. I know Champions deck is usually earlier than that. Um, so if you have a class time that doesn't start super early in the day, you're pretty much chances of getting a spot in these decks, decks are slim to none. Um, and it can be very difficult to locate a spot later in the day without following someone to their car or simply just getting lucky. Uh, I think it would be rare to say that no one in this room as a JMU student has uh, no parking citations. I myself have like five total throughout the entire uh, course of my JMU experience here and what's mainly got me is this pink uh, rectangle here where you see the dark blue uh, 
section of the parking lot which is reserved for faculty. You see the light gray which is reserved for students. And as you can imagine when you're in a rush, uh, sometimes you don't notice the four cones they put in a line to divide the two parking lots and you will accidentally land in a commuter, I mean, excuse me, a faculty lot uh, as opposed to a commuter lot where you'll walk out of class and see a yellow note um, on your windshield. It's a smooth $25 fine and that's a repeat offense for me at least like four or five times, you know, throughout my JMU experience. So here's a little bit of the insight into our problem background. JMU has approximately 21,000 students and 70% of those students live off campus. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that all 70% of the students have a car and are trying to get a spot, um, but if you think about the amount of people uh, that are trying to just get to campus at that time, the transportation methods are limited and your resources are also limited. Um, there's approximately 8,000 parking spots on campus. About probably 7,000 of them are dedicated to students, but if you look at the numbers, that's nowhere near not if every single person was to individually drive themselves. Um, and a lot of students look at this problem as JMU just needs to build more parking, more decks, more lots, where that's not really economically or physically feasible with the growing rate of JMU's population versus the commuters on campus. Um, so this is where we start to reach our solution and we're looking into carpooling. We believe by carpooling that if enough students carpool to campus, there will be fewer commuters. We think mostly students are single car commuters, meaning they're the only person driving their car, which is terrible for parking. If we can get a lot more students to carpool, it will significantly reduce the number of cars trying to park on campus. And if you're a student, I'm sure uh, our second bullet jumped out at you, the Battle for Festival parking lot. Uh, those of you who don't attend JMU, this is one of the more popular parking lots for uh, JMU's East Campus access. A lot of the hard science majors are on East Campus and when we all are whipping around festival parking lot dangerously, sometimes texting and driving, telling people you're going to be late for class, can you sign me in, can you write down my name, you know, uh, these are the kind of issues that JMU students face and as Matt had said, it is due to the single passenger vehicles that are racing around campus trying to find a parking space. So with carpooling, we think it will alleviate some of the issues moving forward. This chart um, is a little bit of a breakdown. We actually uh, came up with this last spring when we were um, coming up with a proposal based on all of our research we had done in the previous two semesters. Um, the top matrix has every single transportation method we looked at um, in Harrisonburg. This includes driving a car, riding the bus, taking a taxi, an Uber, uh, biking to campus, walking, or carpooling. Um, and then on the left column, you'll see some key performance indicators by which we evaluated each of these methods. Uh, this included time spent traveling, cost per trip, environmental impact per person, um, just general overall convenience of using that method, uh, safety and physical health benefits, and fre frequency of use. Um, and so we also factored in, uh, based on student feedback, the importance rating of each of these uh, key performance metrics. And um, we found that students cared most about the time spent traveling and the cost per trip, whereas method or whereas the indicators like environmental impact per person and safety, um, they didn't care about as much. So those were the uh, key factors we looked at when trying to fill this niche. So we looked at every individual mode of transportation, and we looked at walking and biking. They are not very convenient because some people would have to walk 25 minutes if they live very far away. Also, throughout most of the year, it's either too hot or too cold to walk or ride a bike to campus. And the weather also it could be raining, and in that case, you wouldn't want to ride your bike to campus. So we also found that carpooling is a good medium between driving and taking the bus in general convenience. And that's why we chose to do our carpool. So for the, the niche of students that we're trying to attract, I'm not going to read every single bullet word for word, but what I did want to point out is this last bullet. They have to be social and, try, and they're willing to try new things. This is kind of a, uh, a new app, a jump in the right direction for students. And we understand that our app is not going to be at the center of every carpool moving forward. We also understand that carpools are already taking place on campus at JMU among JMU students. This app is more or less in place to allow students to understand what other students are available for them at the same time frame, leaving and getting to campus on certain days. Once you make that initial connect with your carpool group, who's to say that you can't become good friends and uh, you know, take each other's numbers down 
and move forward in the right direction, carpooling frequently almost, you know, one to two, even three or four times a week. This is our mission statement to create a mobile application for JMU student commuters to coordinate carpools. Overall goals include reducing time and traffic, increasing availability of parking, increasing convenience of commute, saving money, reducing individual drivers on the road, and making a positive environmental impact. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to get into some of the more technical pieces um, of our project. Um, this is an IKM um, based project, so we did. Uh, encounter a lot of new technologies. Uh, so first we wanted to talk about um, what makes our project unique and that is it is a progressive web app or a PWA. Um, and so a little bit about PWAs versus a native app. A native app is something that most of you all know and understand to be an app. You log on to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, um, you find the app, you download it, it's on your home screen and it's there for you to use. Uh, every so often, developers will push an update that you have to manually update your phone so that you stay up to date with that particular app. Uh, PWAs are a little bit different. PWAs aren't available on app stores, um, and they're simply just a URL in a web address. Um, you bring that up on your Safari or whatever device you're using, and you just hit Add to Home Screen, and it looks and it functions and it feels like a native app, but it's not. So you don't have to deal with the hassle of downloading, um, and it's always automatically updating. You don't have to be mindful of any of that. Another great advantage to a PWA is that we only have to develop one app. For other platforms, you would have to develop an Android application, an iOS application, and a web app or a website. This is one and all. It functions perfectly as a website and as an app on a phone. There's also some statistics that mobile web traffic is twice as big as app traffic and it's grown at twice the rate and these are just some of the reasons why we chose a PWA. Uh, so one of the last bullet points on the slide before was that uh, developers only need to develop a single code base for a PWA so that so kind of makes it easier to develop and can get out to users more quickly. Um, this slide has a lot of key stats um, which is kind of why we decided to uh, ditch native apps and go the way of the future which was a PWA. Users spend about 80% of their time using just five apps um, so if you think at the top of your head which five apps you spend most of your time using, I'm sure um, it applies to your life as well. For native apps, it takes about six clicks to install, and with each click, you, you, you lose about 20% of your users. So with the PWA, uh, you have far less clicks to get that app on your phone, so therefore we'll be bringing in more users and more students to share rides. Um, also, 60% of the apps in the Google Play Store have never been downloaded. Um, so that just kind of goes to show a lot of apps just never really make it out once they're developed and launched. And for uh, a PWA, PWA being new and uh, improved as opposed to a native app, we do understand this is a new concept and we're going to do our best when advertising the app to let students know that this is a website that can be saved to your home screen as opposed to a native app that is downloaded. This is our technology stack that we used. We used Angular to develop the front end, and this is the interface that you will see, the colors, everything that makes it look pretty when you're on your web browser or on your phone. We used Node as our API. This is the middleman between the front end and the back end. For our back end, we used MongoDB, which is our database. This is where everything, all the data from the app will be stored. So everything that's pushed to the back end and pulled from it, all the rides that students post, that's all saved on the database. And the database is stored on the API, which is the middleman between the front end and the back end. Uh, we also, it's not pictured, we implemented um, a uh, third party authentication system called Auth0, uh, which manages all user account information um, and any validation which provides additional security features. So this picture here just kind of represents the overall, um, all the components that make up the front end. Um, like you saw in the previous slide, Angular 2 is what makes up the front end of our project. Um, for those of you not familiar with development, the front end is kind of what the application logic and where all that lies and what views are rendered to the users. Uh, so Angular 2 includes TypeScript, which is the logic language that kind of uh, feeds your app. And then uh, HTML and CSS are the languages that make up more of the cosmetic features of the app. Um, and NG Bootstrap is a library of CSS and HTML languages that allow us to um, just make our app more user-friendly and the user experience to be improved. 
Um, and then lastly, Auth0 is our third party authentication system, um, which allows us to easily create user accounts, um, set limits on who can make an account, how they can make an account, how an account is validated, um, and so forth. And this Auth0 allows us to make sure that only JMU students are able to sign up for the application using a dukes.jmu.edu email. So here's a slide we just want to talk a little bit about the hurdles and challenges that we faced while developing this app. Uh, first of all, I know myself, Matt, and Andrew had never had any prior development experience, so this whole um, project has been a huge learning curve for us, and learning an entirely new language like TypeScript um, has been definitely a challenge, but um, rewarding at the same time, and we're still continuing to learn um, with each pr progress and each component that we add to our app. For me, the toughest challenge to overcome was the API. This is because I had never done anything with an API before, and just first of all, thinking about how the API was in contact with the app and the database and how everything connected was hard. And then once I got that down, the implementation and the coding was also very challenging. Yeah, and then of course, uh, Alex owns a Mac computer, me and uh, Matt own a Dell, and sometimes there would be some formatting issues when, we, when it came to running code on the uh, separate operating systems. For instance, her uh, web app would look beautiful on one line of code, and for instance, maybe me and Matt's line of, with the same line of code on a Dell, the, the spacing of the text would be all off or something would be misaligned. And these were some of the hurdles that we did have to overcome as well. Uh, and then lastly, um, in the beginning of this year, we were developing a native app. Um, and it wasn't until about December or January um, that Morgan brought the whole idea of uh, progressive web apps to our attention and we really, really felt that this was a change in our project that we'd really like to see implemented in the future. So that meant starting over pretty much completely um, and with a new code base. So that was definitely a setback, but definitely helped us grow in the end. So some of the features that are not included in our app to reduce liability, uh, as you can see, we chose not to include the user's phone number or the home address on their My Account page. Uh, this is for safety reasons and for not being you know, contacted by people you don't want to be contacted by. The internal messaging system in the app is also not in place currently because we don't want to see any signs of cyberbullying or any kind of uh, thing that goes out of line in that regard. We did include, however, a SSL certificate. Uh, this is in place so a secure connection can be in place between our web server to our browser. Uh, this is going to reduce the chances that hackers try to get into our app and mess up the call pools or anything in that nature. So this is our page, just a preview before we do our demo, for posting a ride. So you enter in your ride departure, your date, time, where you're leaving from, and where you're going to, and then you can include a message, and the message could be, I will request a $1 payment, or meet me by the big tree next to the bus stop, and just to help riders find each other easy. Likewise, um, if you want to be a passenger, this is a sneak preview of what your search or ride page would look like. <coughs> uh, you enter in your criteria, which includes where you're going from, or where you're leaving from, where you're going to, uh, the date and time frame of your departure. Um, your time frame will bring up all the rides that match your search criteria uh, within that range, so that you sometimes, if there's enough people posting, you might have a choice between leaving at 11 o'clock versus 11:30, and kind of find a driver that is working to fit your schedule the best. Um, so without further ado, we're going to do a quick demo of our app as it currently stands. Okay. Okay. So I'm log into my phone here. Um, so first, if I'm a first-time user, I already have it pulled up here, but I'm on jmuscoop.com. When I hit our main menu here, I'm going to log in. Um, and for the sake of our demo purposes, I'm just going to use my own personal account that's already been created. Um, however, when you first create an account, it will send you an email verification that you have to click and verify. Um, standard signing up for any um, app or website, I'm sure you're all familiar with that process. Uh, but it's just saved to my Jamie Dukes account. So I'm going to log in. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the app to my home screen like it would be any other app from the store. So it's as simple as add to home screen. And I'll just leave it as Jamie Scoop. And here it is on my home screen. So you can get to it easily and it's easily accessible at any time. 
Um, so first I want to show you what um, your profile looks like. So this is some of the information um, a user might enter on their profile. This is the one I've just made for myself, um, just for demo purposes. It has a quick bio about myself, um, any information that I want possible passengers to know or drivers to know about me. Um, I have information about my car, the make and the model, and how many seats I can usually um, take if I were to be a driver. So let's say um, this morning, um, or this afternoon when I'm leaving campus, I want to post that I'm giving a ride. So I'd come to our post a ride page. Um, so here I'm going to enter in our departure date information. So today is April 21st, 2017. Um, and let's say I'm leaving at 4.30. And I'm coming from East Campus. And I'm going to Sunchase Apartments. Um, and since I'm coming from East Campus, East Campus is pretty big and spread out, and so the note I want to leave for my riders is to meet me at the FizzCam bus stop. <laughs> Autocorrect. <laughs> okay. So, there's my ride, um, in a nutshell. Um, as you can see that the leaving from and going to location options are pre-populated um, so that users have a list of areas that are commonplace. So our ride has been added. So if we go to my carpools. I already have one uh, ride here that I gave in the past and I went from the Harrison to Lakeside. Um, but I just want to look at my ride from Sunchase to or from East Campus to Sunchase. So we look into our carpool, we'll see a little bit more information. This is not a real picture of my car, but just a sample. <laughs> um, it has all the information about my ride, including the date, the time we're leaving, um, all the information we just entered in. And currently no one has signed up for my ride yet, so the passengers are zero. Um, but let's say this morning I was looking for a ride to campus. So I would visit our uh, find a ride page. So here we want to enter in our search criteria. And I'm leaving from Copper Beach in this scenario. And I'm going to main campus. Maybe I have a gen ed over there, but I'm usually over here. Um, today we'll select our date. And let's say I want to leave in the morning anytime from about uh, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And as you can see, filling out all this information is really si simple and there's not much you need to do other than just hit search. So I have three results here that pulled up. Andrew's giving a ride, Matt's giving a ride, and Emma is giving a ride also. Um, they're all going from the same locations, but they're all leaving at slightly different times. One's at 10.30, one's at 10.45, one's at 10.50. I kind of like 10.45. It sounds like it'll get me where I need to go just in the right amount of time. It won't be too early or too late. So I'm gonna go check out Matt's profile first. Um, and here's just a sample profile if you wanna check out um, Matt's. He doesn't have a picture up yet or his car information. Um, so it's up to the discretion of the users how much they wanna share um, with other users of the app. But all looks good. So I think I'm gonna join his carpool. So I hit the join carpool button. It's gonna confirm with me and yes, I want to drive. Um, so essentially those are the main features of the app. Um, still currently in development, but that is how it stands currently. So this is what we are looking ahead, what our next steps are, and what the group that is coming up coming up after us will be doing. Oh. Looks like half black. black screens. Our slides is cut off. Okay, uh, so I'll, although the slide is cut off, I'll try to describe this to you. Uh, the top line is simply a statistic telling you that there are 15,000 commuters at JMU at, during any given semester. How do we know this? This is because there's about 21,000 students here. About 70% of them are off campus. Now, we're assuming that 75% of these off campus students are in state students. That's where this table comes in. And this is a credit hour uh, cost table. As you can see, if you're a full-time student, this is the in-state statistic. If you're a uh, out-of-state student, this is the 
uh, out of state statistic per credit hour. What it comes down to is that you're paying about $50 per class if you're an in-state student. If you're an out-of-state student, you're paying about $120 per class. So as you can see, all we're going to assume is just a humble number here that if you're, if you're commuting per semester and you miss two classes per semester, out of all those students that miss those classes, that's over $2 million in losses in tuition if you miss, you know, if these students are missing just two classes. And I'd argue that students are missing more than just two classes due to transportation issues. So here's the thing. We wanted to say, all right, how about, how about our app achieves the national average that we get 10% of drivers, and like, you, like I said, 15,000 commuters, that's only 1,500 JMU commuters carpooling. You multiply those gains together, this number is 75% of the 1,500, the in-state students. This 375 is the other remaining 25% of the 1,500 JMU commuters who would be carpooling. You multiply those savings, add them together, that's $202,000 that our app has brought back to the school in tuition savings to the students. You know, these, this is money being saved, they're going to class, they're getting there on time. And we just thought that although it's a small number compared to the two million, it's pretty significant in the sense that these numbers are just, you know, they're kind of, they're humble choices in the sense that we did have to make some assumptions, but we did just want to share with you that this app does have some financial implications moving forward. So the future of JMU Scoop will be in the hands of reopening. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's cut off. Okay. I don't know. Uh, uh, well, the title says the future of JM Scoop. So currently we have some junior, a team of juniors that has signed on to continue the project after we finish it. And some things that they will be doing, they will work some computer simulations and try and quantify the success in terms of parking lots saved and environmental impact. And they will also implement some more of the core features that we have not had time to implement yet. And uh, we are considering, uh, you know, after these juniors uh, work on quantifying the success of our app, they're going to run some computer simulations, see how many people are actually using our app. If it is successful on a, on a wide scale, we will consider expanding it to other universities where we do see it uh, will fit into other universities properly. For instance, you saw Alex use some of those predetermined destinations when she's looking for a ride. Uh, you know, a Virginia Tech programmer could easily assemble that list of uh, predetermined de destinations, put it into their app and incorporate it at their school. Uh, once it's incorporated into other Virginia schools, we don't see any reason why it can't go up the East Coast or even across the country. Uh, so we want to say a big thank you to Dr. Benton, who's helped us um, through every challenge and hurdle we've had over the course of this project. Um, we definitely couldn't have done it without him. Um, so a big thank you to him, and we'll take any questions. Uh, was there a particular reason you chose the tech stack that you did? The tech right. stack? Mongo, oh. Node, well, Angular. It just fit. Angular was the option that we chose because it was able to be pushed out to um, Android, iOS, and to online, like on the internet. And it was just an easy way that we saw doing it. It fit in, it was similar to Ionic, which we were using before for the um, native app. We also felt that uh, the tech stack we used was going to be the easiest learning curve. Um, also, last fall, I know Andrew, Matt, and I were all in three of Dr. Benton's classes where we were using these same technologies. So in addition to using them in those classes, um, we learned more about them by using them in our project. So it just kind of all worked out, um, so we spent our time focusing on those. I have one more. Um, uh, if you guys had extra time. Um, what's one feature that each of you would have liked to have implemented if you had the time? I personally definitely want to see, as the next group takes over, um, the internal messaging system implemented for drivers because I think um, sometimes um, messages get lost in translation. Um, but one thing we didn't want to compromise about the app was the security feature. That's why we didn't list phone numbers. Um, so if the internal messaging um, feature, feature could be included, um, I'd really like to see that come to life. 
There weren't too many other features that we thought about. We wanted to keep it simple and concise mm -hmm. just so that it would be easy to use in a pinch and very easy for everyone to understand. Yeah, I think uh, maybe moving forward, I would like a required uh, Venmo handle for drivers. Um, I think Venmo is so popular among JMU students that if the option, if they are requesting a payment, I believe Venmo is the easiest option to uh, pay somebody with. And just for the means of saving time for the fellow carpoolers, they can just easily access the user's profile, get their Venmo handle, and make that payment. Did you approach the university on dedicating parking spaces for commuters that are using the app versus, I mean, what stops you from getting four people in a car and get to campus and drive around for 20 minutes and everybody's late for class? We definitely uh, had discussed this in the early stages of the project, um, getting parking services in on this, and maybe in the future implementing uh, special parker parking spaces for the users of this app. Um, however, within the scope of our project this year, um, we weren't able to get to that phase, but we hope that groups in the future would also. Um, yeah, it's definitely a quality idea moving forward. Um, something else to be considered is the just the general sense of JMU Parking Services promoting this in mass emails to students. Um, we do feel the the more aware the students are that this app is there and that it's effective is that's what's going to make it more effective to alleviate some of the parking issues on campus. What, uh, what piece of your guys' code are you the, kind of the most proud of? Um, what was like the hardest thing to implement for you, or you know, kind of what feature you know are you really proud of? Um. I think it was being able to connect the front end to the back end, um, just learning how to use the server and the API to post command and get commands to the uh, database was the yeah. hardest part, and we were able to successfully do it, so that was exciting. It's one thing to spend all of your time developing these pretty pages with HTML and CSS, but if they don't do anything or the data doesn't go anywhere, then what's really the point? So the minute that we were able to connect those two pieces together, I think was the most satisfying. It wasn't super clear, but it is live on jmuscoop.com. Yes. If you're a JMU student, have a Duke's email, create an account. Still in the beta phase, but you could get by with using it. Better than alpha.